Hello, folks, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis of the Institute for Local Self Reliance's Composting from Community Initiative, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Today is World Soil Day, which aims to elevate the important role our soils play in the health of our food systems, our climate, and the planet, as well as to empower and engage citizens around the world to contribute to improving soil health. High quality compost is an important tool in the soil health toolbox and this requires robust local composting infrastructure. There are many opportunities for communities around the country to take an active role in advancing composting by tying it to soil health, and that is the focus of today's webinar. Our esteemed panel will guide us through the proliferation of soil health policies, existing intersections with composting policy, and a menu of opportunities to better connect the two uh, at local, state, and federal levels. ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, regenerate local soils, build greater equity, and protect the climate. We work to catalyze distributed, locally-based composting options that include home, community, and on-farm initiatives. <clears throat> we provide a variety of technical support, technical and policy support to communities around the country, and have a wealth of resources on our website, including reports, infographics, webinars, a podcast, and a policy library and map. You can find all of these resources on our website by using that drop-down menu. Alrighty, so we also want to draw your attention to a timely opportunity. The EPA has announced $4.6 billion available for grants to reduce climate and air pollution. This is a unique opportunity to advance and implement transformative decarbonization programs and policies. Composting for healthy soils can be a powerful nature-based solution with cross-cutting benefits. The first step for, to qualify for funding is to get composting and soil health strategies documented in local priority climate action plans, which are due March 1st. This webinar will outline some model policies that can be replicated, and we are providing further guidance on this opportunity on our website. We're also interested in supporting these policies and being adopted and adapted. To learn more, complete the sign-up form we just posted in the chat, or if you're watching the recording of this webinar, you can learn more at the web address on this slide. Alrighty, so now we're going to get to know each other a little bit with some interactive polls. Alrighty, so where are you participating from? The Eastern U.S., Southern U.S., Western U.S., Midwest U.S., or outside of the U.S.? Okay, give you all just another second. All right, let's see the results. Okay, a good majority from the Eastern US, but even probably one person from outside of the US. So welcome to everyone. Uh, next question, please. <clears throat> so what best describes your affiliation? Select one or more of the following. Are you a farmer or farm service provider, a composter, someone representing government at any level? Are you a policymaker or advocate or other? And if you select other, please add to the chat so that we know what that means. All right, awesome mix. Um, fabulous to have you all here. Um, and we'll look forward to finding out what other means uh, when we look at the results. All right. Next question. What is your relationship to composting? I compost. I use compost. I advocate for compost or composting. I regulate compost or composting. Or I'm curious about compost or composting. If I set it up right, you should be able to choose more than one. All right, let's see the results. All righty. So a strong majority already compost or advocate for compost and composting. Awesome. Good. 54% of you already use compost. And there's a good mix of compost curious and those regulating. So awesome. Thank you for all, all for joining. We're going to do one more question. All right, so I am already advancing or interested in advancing 
these policies in my community? And we'll go ahead and ask this at the end, um, but are you interested in advancing soil health policies? Let's see what you answer now, and then we're gonna do it again at the end. <laughs> but there's a very clear uh, trend already. Nice, you guys are in the right place and we have the right people on this webinar. So thank you all for joining. So at this point, um, while I introduce our first presenter, uh, we're gonna hand controls over to him. Um, and just before that, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, you may have noticed that everyone is in listen only mode. Um, if time allows, we'll take a couple of questions between presentations, but enter your questions uh, as they come up in the GoToWebinar control panel box on your screen. And if you can include who you're directing your questions to, that's really appreciated. Um, this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you within a, the next day or so. Um, you should also see copies of the PDFs of the presentation slide decks as attachments here, but it will, they will also be sent to you in the follow-up email. Um, also, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up uh, and this will provide you an opportunity to give us feedback, which we value very greatly. Um, it'll also uh, provide other opportunities of connecting with us. All right, so now to our first presenter. Stephen Coletti has been a dedicated advocate for state healthy soils legislation, who has helped draft legislation and build coalitions to advance policies in numerous states around the country over the past several years. He helps state groups with strategy, coordination, and pursuing funding for advancing soil health plans and practice implementation. He has been doing this as a volunteer with occasional support and does not work for or represent any organization or coalition. He has a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Missouri, Rolla. So without further ado, take it away, Stephen. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, it's really a great opportunity um, now to um, move the, the conversations on, on compost because of all the great success that's been done by so many people across the country in advancing policy at the state level and at the federal level. Um, if you haven't joined the group and you're interested in uh, sharing or hearing about uh, healthy soil legislation, you can join the Google group, uh, uh, healthy soils legislation uh, at googlegroups.com. Uh, or uh, you can email me uh, at stephen at healthysoilspolicy.org. Um, the, uh, the, the, because of the great advances, you know, we can make a lot of progress in getting uh, composting uh, uh, more aware to legislators and, and uh, policy folks. The, the current status is there's a lot of programs in over half the uh, states in the country covering over half the land uh, in, under farming. Uh, there's incentives, action plans, and pilot programs at various levels of development. Some states are very far ahead in developing action plans and pilot programs. Others are working on creating regulations to do those. There are various uh, groups in uh, different watersheds across the country doing payments for ecosystem services, trying to connect payments for improving soil health through uh, to help uh, uh, by people who benefit from that. There's uh, a lot of improvements in getting farmer to farmer training. That's been the big weakness in moving uh, soil health policy forward, as well as composting. It, it really helps to have people in local areas helping other people develop their techniques and their uh, different options for doing soil health and composting. It's been a really big issue uh, over the years. And uh, so most of the work on soil health involves including social equity and environmental justice in, and addressing those issues simultaneously. Over these, this period of time of developing state legislation, those elements have been included in legislation and it's been very timely that the conversation has been moving at the federal as well as the state level. And much of the progress across the country um, has been aided by regional collaborations. In the Northeast, there have been groups like the Northeast Organic Farming Association, that the different chapters help move legislation forward in different states together. And in the, in the Southwest, there was various conservation districts that collaborated or shared information on what they were working on in order to help promote the passage of uh, legislation in the in North, in the Southeast, in the Southwest. So basically uh, those same collaborations that help with soil health can also help in moving composting legislation and policy forward. 
there's been various local ecosystem service areas that people don't necessarily call them that, but there's these opportunities where people see the benefits of uh, flood mitigation, drought uh, resilience, crop res uh, risk reduction by uh, uh, you know, increasing the uh, access of uh, compost and sharing of compost and improvement of soil health. There's been various groups, many more always showing up uh, to do market incentives and tax credits. And there are now waves of state constitutional amendments. There's various states that have had in their state constitution support for conservation and conservation funding through the sales tax and uh, severance taxes. And now we're seeing a wave of green amendments. Uh, a lot. Of, if you want more information on those various green amendments, it's uh, you can look at forthegenerations.org. So. Uh, the progress on soil uh, health has been mainly because of the uh, uh, involvement of farmer-led, you know, efforts through either the soil and water conservation districts, through state organic farming groups, and other farming groups uh, such as uh, 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 you know, the um, union, uh, uh, farmers union, etc. There's various food policy groups in regional areas that have been very helpful in moving the conversation forward, and the use of policy resolutions is important. Uh, a lot of people don't know that to move uh, the policy of many state organizations, policy resolutions have to be submitted at the uh, uh, local level and trickle up to the state level to shift policy at the state level so that state organizations can be more active in supporting soil health and compost and other things that help ecosystem health. Most of the efforts have been very bipartisan and nonpartisan. The Bills have been submitted by members of both parties and have passed almost unanimously in the states. I think that that uh, you know, precedent will show that I, that composting will have a similar kind of support when those kinds of bills are put forward. These uh, so it's the regional groups that help because a lot of people don't necessarily want to be too far ahead of things. There's a lot of opportunity with the resource conservation districts in the Great Plains areas to move conversations there, for example. And there are various groups in the South, uh, I mean in the uh, Midwest, who work across various states who could also move these conversations forward. But in all these things, the principles and practices of policy work seem to very much, you know, uh, echo the principles of soil health. Uh, you keep the ground covered by, that is, being there, listening, finding out what's happening, uh, and, and working with people to find out what their issues are, and uh, not to create tumult. The point is to be finding solutions, not creating problems. Uh, we used to say in chemistry <laughs> classes, is like, you can either be a part of the solution or you're gonna be part of the precipitate. So we have uh, a lot of opportunities to you know, lay in permanent roots and, and help rebuild the social mycelium. So in these, all these conversations on soil health, it's always been leading with why, not how you're gonna get the money, but when it's like anything, you start with what you want and then figure out how to pay for it. Usually that comes through very quickly. So we lead with, um, you know that you know healthy soils a one percent increase in organic matter holds twenty thousand more gallons per acre so it's easy to connect the dots between soil health and flood mitigation and uh, and uh, drought resilience because when the soil's healthy you're able to handle these extreme weather events more uh, cleanly or efficiently letting nature do the work then that reduced runoff helps protect water quality. The soil sponge helps hold nutrients better. There are some nutrients that tend to run off more quickly when, as the soil becomes more healthy, but that can be dealt with. The point is, is that we want to return the soil and the ecosystems back to their healthy state. These uh, healthier soils help, as many of you know, reduce, require less fertilizer and the fungi, fungal and bacterial masses are able to supply the nutrients to the plants rather than having the additives added. So we have better and healthier crops. There's reduction in, uh, uh, in, in soil loss. A lot of people you know, want to try to market you know, soil carbon as a way of offsetting current emissions. But the point is, is that really agriculture needs to claw back the history, historic loss of carbon from soils. And it's really appropriate that uh, the agriculture is bringing back the carbon that's been lost from agriculture and not using that in some sort of shell game to allow uh, continued em emissions. The 
increase in farm profits is what's really helped move legislation forward in a lot of areas. Recognition that the, uh, the of an improvement of $100 per acre in profits, mostly due to the law, the less inputs required and the ability to um, um, avoid uh, extra labor and, and uh, fuel costs and applying those uh, ad, uh, those extra pesticides and fertilizers. So these are uh, a lot of the benefits of compost. And so where we're at is that, you know, you know, as a lot of people who know is are involved with compost, so to be repeating our, myself, but or what you already know, but it, we know that by it's like kickstarting the health of the soil to uh, improve the soil structure, the porosity, the density, to improve the infiltration rates, and to hold the water on the land so the the, ha the land can heal, the soil can heal, and that extra water holding capacity helps um, repair the water cycle in, in the microclimate and in the region. And that helps with the, uh, you know, also with the access to the mi uh, macro and micronutrients because as the soil biome is made healthy again, the, the plants are able to get the nutrients they need. So it also helps reduce pathogens because just like a person, the analogy is, you know, if, if you're sick, you know, you're more uh, apt to have problems with pathogens, the same thing with the, the soil. So. Uh, we want to make sure we get improve the organic matter. We want to make the the uh, you know chemistry of the soil uh, uh, repaired in terms of like just like the body's chemistry, and we want to improve the pH, et cetera. So, so the how composting helps soil is not understood by most legislators. I'll get repeat this again: is that to help expand things to a new audience, you have to have them a reason to learn about it. And so legislation helps make sure that legislators and staff understand the importance of, of composting. And so that's what helped with passing soil health legislation. And the same thing can be done with composting, that by, you know, you know healthier soils makes more nutrients and more nutritious food. It helps reduce soil loss. And so that helps us get further along. So by healing the ecosystem, then we deal with water issues. The passage of legislation across the country has hinged upon not using cultural divisive uh, uh, terminology like climate carbon. In fact, we say soil organic matter. It's all about water. Most of the issues in the Southwest uh, were about water lack. A lot of issues in the Northeast were about uh, mitigating flood damage and uh, handling, you know, uh, the, the extreme weather events that have been happening in the Northeast. So focusing on water is important, and the same thing is true with trying to push forward uh, healthy soils uh, in, in composting legislation. So just the ecosystem services of water is enough to support funding for healthy soils uh, and so also for compost. A lot of people talk about the carbon drawdown, but it is really just a bonus. So we want to make sure for the soil health that we bring the the organic matter back to the soil and the ecosystem. So now that legislators understand the importance of soil health in many states, they, we can now explain the importance of bringing the organic matter back to the soil to help repair the soil and the ecosystem. So I said before, there's a lot, you know, a lot of importance in education through legislation. If you don't have something that you're trying to, you know, advocate for at the legislature, you're not going to have them learn about it. Like any job. They don't get paid or get their job review based on what they're going to, uh, you know, something that's not before them. And so we want to make sure every session there's something on composting or healthy soils or related issues like uh, overuse of pesticides, et cetera, to help legislators have a reason to understand about the issue and then do the right thing. Most uh, legislators are very savvy and, and staff are very savvy. And once they appreciate the facts of the situation, they respond very well accordingly. So one of the things that helps is the, uh, the, as well at the uh, bureaucratic level is to the creation of soil health action plans. So getting funding uh, through a, a, a state budget for action plans helps, and, and it also helps to make sure that those action plans include plans for uh, you know dealing with you know improving composting capacity distribution and the gathering of and diversion of uh, organic waste from the waste stream. Uh, it's very important to have healthy soils pilot programs. Also important to have composting programs, uh, pilot programs across states, so that one does not need to go far in order to learn about composting or to uh, have composting done. So here's a quick 
showing of how the um, prog progression across the country of, of soil health legislation in 2020. There was a lot of bills that had passed in early 2016, 2015, there were some early bills. So we saw a lot of interest and then in, uh, there's a lot of groundwork, so to speak, left <laughs> laid out in, uh, in from 2017 to get bills ready to be uh, through the legislatures. And then in 2021, uh, we had a remarkable increase in passage of legislation across the country. You notice here in the Northeast and in the Southwest. And then a few more states filling in some of the uh, areas in 2022. Uh, we got some, uh, so just going back, you see just very little change. And then West Virginia also changed. A lot of states included soil health by changing their enabling legislation to the conservation districts. Conservation districts are key working on soil health as well as on composting. So involving the conservation districts is really important in moving uh, policy and legislation forward. In this year, we had a few more states showing about half the, the country uh, in land area, farming area, population, and number of states being under healthy soils uh, legislation having been passed. Here's a quick slide showing that progression that I just said from 10 states in, uh, having passed laws in 2019, 2020, uh, to 20 uh, states passing in 2021. And at the end of this year, we have laws in 25 states and Pennsylvania has a, a program that they've launched under an old statute um, to help move things forward. So where are we heading now? So we have these 26 states where things have happened, where there, there's either legislation that's been enacted to create um, uh, soil health programs or enables the conservation districts or other entities to create a soil health program. These same state legislatures, because they've demonstrated an appreciation of the importance of soil health, they're the most likely places where we could take the conversation to the next level to be receptive to having legislation to talk about composting. So here's a map from 2022 showing the number of states that had soil health and composting legislation. And then in 2023, you see that the same states that had passed uh, legislation are also the same states that have passed uh, soil health legislation, but we're not really seeing much action uh, in the states that haven't um, passed legislation. So we have a lot of opportunities in the Southwest and the Southeast, I mean, Southwest and Northeast, and we can do more. If you're interested in the federal, I mean, Alicia, Alicia is going to be covering more on the federal, but there's some places here that you can see some of the ag policy. Uh, you can follow these links in the slide deck as follows. I have a lot of backup slides with other information of opportunities for funding. I know one that's notable is under the, uh, um, the uh, you know, recent legislation at the federal level, they changed 45Q, which is the carbon sequestration tax credit law. So because of some structures of how that law is, one can, through the avoided emissions clause and through the uh, commercial product clause, actually start to claim 45Q tax credits for smaller operations that essentially are avoiding emissions, but it has to be something that's not uh, volatile. So compost is a volatile carbon, but it can be done in a way that maybe can collect some of that tax credit versus it being burned, which is very clearly being emitted. So the, it's important to build coalitions. Uh, this is what's really helped move the things along. So the existing coalitions that have helped work on these things involve the soil and water conservation districts, that, like I mentioned, uh, organic farming groups. Watershed Association has been very key in the conversation because of water quality issues. A lot of food policy groups are very interested because of the nutrient content of food and uh, the avoidance of waste. Uh, there's a lot of conservation organizations that are very interested, yet they tend to realize they have to take a back seat to uh, the farming groups and other groups taking the lead on these kinds of issues. A lot of composting groups have been interested in forestry groups. The biggest thing is making sure we have farming and ranching groups involved, and it's very important to have someone facilitating the conversations. Most of the reasons we haven't had a lot of composting legislation move forward is because someone or some group hasn't committed the time to help facilitate bringing people together to talk with each other about what they want to promote as legislation and how to reach out to legislators and staff to move the, the bills out of committee and forward. The regional approach in that sense works because if you have 
people facilitating in a few adjoining states, that momentum is is greatly increased. Again, just to repeat, you know, we have the, the funding. There's also ability through appropriation cycles at the state level to help get a little bit of money to start things. So not all legislation is the same. You know, some things are put things in statute. Some things are in the acts of the, the legislature for doing funding. So each state has a slightly different structure of how their legislation works. So in many of these cases, getting just a little seed money to start things helps. For example, in Kansas, they have not passed the soil health initiative in their statutes, but they have funded it effectively and created it the last couple sessions by having the, the Kansas soil health initiative in their state budget. So what's important from those pilot programs and those things is to try to get the cost benefit data, really helping show to legislators we've spent this much money and this is what we got out of it. This is what we got in terms of improved infiltration rates or increased carbon, any kind of metrics that helps uh, measure giving money to soil health and composting versus other people, uh, other kinds of programs that people are asking for money. It's very important that there are opportunities for fees on externalities. Uh, fertilizer fees are far below what they really should be considering what fees are on other uh, kinds of uh, chemicals that have uh, environmental impacts. Even a small change in those fees would help fund the, the services that actually would save farmers money more than the increase in fees because that increase in money can help with efficiency programs and avoiding excess application of those products. So in, in closing, the main thing has been that most of the difficulties in passing legislation on, on soil health and composting have been due to doubt and delay. A lot of people think there's a lot of resistance. But the re re reality is, is that there's no groups uh, that are actively opposed to soil health policy. How can anyone really be against health? And that's really, most people have a common you know, thing that they, they'd like to continue to eat and be healthy. So really we don't see any opposition. Most of it comes from doubt and people feeling like they can't move forward because they're afraid of what their constituents might think, et cetera. It's always important to start with farmers and farm groups. Uh, sometimes people in the states have moved forward without engaging with those groups first, and that's delayed things by a year or so because they had to go back and have those conversations to make sure that the concerns of those groups were being included in the legislation. It's always important to use non-divisive terms like healthy soils rather than regenerative agriculture. Things have proceeded in the last few years to the point where now we're in a situation where you can get, um, we're talking about making sure there's a definition for regenerative agriculture because the term is being co-opted. Healthy soils was actually created as a term because a lot of folks thought that when you said regenerative agriculture, you wanted them to become organic because regenerative agriculture came out of Rodale and the work on being beyond organic. And the, so the conventional farmers felt like they were being pushed into being organic and the organic farmers felt that their, the, the term was being co-opted. Now we're at a position where we feel like we really need to make sure regenerative agriculture is properly defined. In the meantime, healthy soils has been the term. And so it's always good also to, uh, to make sure the soil water connection and include watershed health in the discussion because that's been, is more on people's mind. And then it's important to build like in these state and regional collaborations because it's, these are bipartisan efforts or nonpartisan efforts, as I've mentioned before. And it's always important to start with the soil and water conservation districts and the departments of ag with, as coalition partners. Many times the legislation actually comes out of those departments recognizing the importance to update their enabling legislation to include soil health and watershed health. So thank you very much and appreciate your, uh, your listening and uh, hope this helps folks get encouraged to uh, do more composting legislation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that amazing overview and for sharing your sage and well-seasoned advice. Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is my colleague here at the Institute. Sophia Jones is the policy lead for our Composting for Community initiative, and she re researches, analyzes, and supports the building of U.S. policy that advances local composting. She also works on the development team, coordinating fundraising and outreach for ILSR. She received her BA in Environment and Development Studies from McGill University. 
So Sophia, welcome and take it away. Thanks, Linda. Um, and thanks, Stephen, for that great overview of the proliferation of healthy soils policies throughout the US. Um, I will be giving an overview of healthy soils policy and compost policy and the connections and opportunities to connect the two. Um, so I will be presenting information from our recently released healthy soils and compost policy guide that Linda and I developed with input from Stephen um, and some of our other um, allies in the space. Uh, we'll be sharing a link in the chat shortly so you can go take a look for yourselves. Um, this guide was developed to start to bridge the gap um, between the many new healthy soils policies being adopted and um, both new and existing policies addressing composting and compost use. Our hope is that it will provide a starting point from which you can jump into advancing composting and soil health in your communities. So when we think about composting, um, we might first think about its value in diverting wasted materials from incinerators and landfills, um, where those organic materials burn or break down and produce methane, carbon dioxide, a whole slew of other pollutants that um, disproportionately affect black and brown communities in the US. However, there's a more cyclical picture that we need to keep in mind in our discussions around compost. So when we grow food and other crops for harvest or organic matter and nutrients are removed from the soil. Um, so if those food scraps are sent for disposal, that creates this one way um, linear pathway that just depletes soil health and fills landfills and feeds incinerators. Um, alternatively, we can take food scraps and other organic materials, compost them, and return some of those previously removed nutrients and organic matter back into the soil in stable form. Um, now, you might imagine that this cyclical system works best when you return um, organic matter and nutrients to those same soils that gave up the organic matter and nutrients to grow food. And keeping the compost process and um, the compost use local aligns with our perspective at ILSR that localized community scale composting systems are preferable to and should be prioritized over larger centralized systems. Um, and good policy at the state and federal level is crucial in order to um, enable and support this local level of composting. If you'd like to learn more about this lens, we have lots of information on our website, um, including this hierarchy to reduce food waste and grow community, and also our page on community composting. Um, I will, will hopefully be seeing those links in the chat shortly as well. So compost has been shown to build soil health and improve soil function in many ways, including water and nutrient cycling, resilience to extreme weather conditions, better crop yields, reduce reliance on chemical inputs like fertilizers and pesticides, and support for soil biodiversity. Um, we do have a couple of infographics that touch on this from a bit of a broader lens, um, including this one right here and this one on um, this slide that uh, focuses on compost to build soil health from the perspective of the climate crisis. Um, and you can find these on our site as well. Um, soil health has been a key indicator for human and ecosystem survival for millennia. And um, with the US currently experiencing Dust Bowl era erosion rates, um, now's really the time to pull out all the stops to preserve soil health and to fully utilize and invest in compost as one tool that can bridge our waste problem and our soil health challenges. Um, so the science is there, but we're still seeing a bit of a disconnect between 
compost and soil health in the policy space. So what we're seeing is that state and local soil health policies have gained momentum over the past number of years. Um, as you heard from Stephen just before, we see more and more soil health policies being introduced and passed. And this is really great. Um, however, compost is not often identified within these policies, uh, despite the proven connections. From the other end, there are some compost policies that directly cite soil health as a benefit of compost application. Um, however, preventing and mitigating contamination of compost and thus soil contamination um, is often weak and something should, that should be strengthened in compost policy as well. So making the connection between compost and healthy soils in policies is really important because when policies don't make it clear, um, it may not get captured or translated to the resulting regulations, programs, and funding. So we saw in Stephen's presentation that there are many, many states with healthy soils programs now. Um, there are only a handful of state soil health policies that directly incorporate compost into the toolbox of soil health building practices. Um, I've highlighted those here and they range from California to Oklahoma to Hawaii, which is really great to see. And um, we have write-ups going into detail on these policies in ILSR's composting rules library. The link is in the chat as well for you to check that out. Um, those are good examples to reference. So we see a number of specific opportunities to better reflect the relationship between compost and soil health in policy. Um, they include, you know, bringing folks from these two circles together to expand advocacy coalitions, um, dedicating funding to composting and compost use in the context of soil health adopting policies that encourage high quality compost production and applying it to soils, um, raising both public and policymaker awareness on the inherent connections between the two, and incorporating compost into national regulations and standards on soil health. So this guide breaks down specific policy categories that can be targeted in advocacy and policymaking. We include um, examples of good existing state or local policies. In some cases, we link to policy templates. We've also highlighted certain policy elements you want to avoid and examples of existing policies that could be amended. And we generally grouped the policy categories into three themes, which are um, contamination, application, and access and awareness. And um, keep in mind that as you go through these policy highlights and recommendations in the guide, um, we acknowledge that the information in the guide will need to be adjusted over time as research advances and um, as new challenges arise and get addressed. And uh, we've already received some really valuable feedback on the guide that um, we'll be incorporating and we'll be doing our best to keep it current and accurate for you. Um, so to get into contamination, we have uh, policies addressing contamination in compost feedstocks. Um, they're important because they can help ensure that soils receive all the benefits of compost while mitigating the risks of harmful contaminants. So some of these include source separation of organic materials from non-compostable materials, um, compost quality standard, standards and testing parameters um, to limit contamination and encourage production of high quality compost, support for distributed composting infrastructure, including funding, permit exemptions, and inclusive zoning codes, um, PFAS policies that focus upstream, for example, manufacturer responsibility and uh, bans on use of PFAS in foodware, and then just encouraging more research on PFAS in compost and soil, um, and then setting clear compostable packaging labeling standards 
while also prioritizing policy that moves us away from single-use food serviceware toward durables. Um, one example or two examples in the category of policies that support distributed infrastructure um, are here. And this category is important because um, maintaining a, a smaller geographic footprint for this process um, can support this circular system I introduced earlier of returning organic matter and nutrients um, that are removed from soils back into the same area. And on-farm and community composting are great ways to keep the process local and encourage community stewardship of the compost process. And um, this impacts contamination because, for example, um, a community garden that composts would have a direct stake and interest in uh, minimizing contamination of compost produced on site, especially if they're applying it to their own garden beds. So these two examples here are um, San Diego has a zoning code that explicitly supports community composting and Montgomery County, Maryland um, has a great strategic plan to advance composting that prioritizes distributed infrastructure. Um, so we have more examples in this guide and in our composting rules library. In the category of application, policies can create markets for compost, encourage application of compost to disturbed soils, and support farmers in maintaining and restoring agricultural soils. And the policy categories we've highlighted here are compost amended soil requirements that can restore health of soils and create markets for compost, um, compost procurement policies that encourage compost use to rebuild soil and increase that demand for high quality compost. Nutrient management policies can incorporate compost application to uh, work towards protecting water quality and preventing nutrient loss through erosion, um, also reducing reliance on synthetic fertilizers. And on-farm composting and compost use policies should prioritize support for farmers um, through dedicated funding, permit exemptions, supportive zoning, and technical assistance. And again, we have lots of examples of these policies in our guide and more in our composting rules library online. Um, two examples of good compost procurement policies that encourage public use of compost in disturbed soils and create markets for high quality soil amendments include this model compost procurement policy produced by NRDC and the Environmental Law Institute that state or local governments can adapt to fit their needs. Um, and then King County, Washington's compost procurement policy is quite good as well. Both of these encourage procurement of locally produced and high quality compost. Within access and awareness, the policies um, here serve to ensure that progress is made in an equitable manner um, and to raise awareness on the role of compost in soil health and vice versa. Um, and within our efforts to expand composting and build soil health, um, equitable access to funding land, staffing, and other resources um, can be enabling or disabling factors. So, pri so policies prioritizing funding and support to underserved communities and ensuring reliable land access are essential to account for structural inequities here. Um, additionally, healthy soils and compost awareness weeks, as well as study bills can expand public and policymaker awareness on the connections between composting and soil health. Um, and because elected officials are more likely to learn about issue areas when a specific policy proposal is being discussed, um, these can be really good tools um, to educate. So here we have actually a good federal example. Um, this is a proposed bill, the Compost Act, and it would designate priority funding to 
underserved communities and small and diverse businesses. Um, and this guide primarily focuses on state and local policy, but we do touch on some Fed examples like this one. Um, but we'll get to hear more about the federal policy landscape from our next presenter, Aisha, very shortly. Um, there are a number of other related issues and considerations that were beyond the scope of this resource, um, but that are worth looking into and learning about from experts in those fields. Um, they include things like mitigating spread of invasive species, um, additional materials that you can use to amend soil or compost, um, a farm worker pay equity and parity pricing, um, and additional accessibility considerations, just to name a few. So I encourage you to um, go research beyond what's in here. Um, so to wrap this up, I want to emphasize that there are many opportunities for policy as a tool to lift up and advance soil health and compost as interconnected sectors. There are also many ways to collaborate and build larger coalitions to move this work forward. Um, we see some great examples of policies that move progress forward at the state or local levels, but we do need more good policy at all levels throughout the country. Um, to make the kind of impact that we need at this point in time. So we hope that this helps you all start somewhere um, in whatever capacity that looks like for you. Um, but we uh, do especially want to hear from you policymakers and advocates out there um, that might already be or are interested in advancing these policies. Um, we want to know how it's going and what kind of support would be most helpful for you in um, moving these policy policies forward? So um, I will I will put my contact info in the chat as well for you to reach out directly. But please do fill out our surveys. Um, and with that, thank you all, and I'll hand it back to Linda. Awesome! Thank you, Sophia, for that great overview of our new guide. Um, so I think at this point, uh, yeah, I can share my screen just as we're uh, answering questions. I don't know if y'all can see that, but um, okay. So questions that came up, um, we'll take a couple now. Um, one question had to do with whether our posters, our infographics are available for to be uh, printed for sale. Um, and at this point, we don't generally do the printing of our infographics, but they are available to be downloaded for printing. Um, so hopefully that will work for you all. Um, another question had to do with anaerobic digestion. Um, I think from our hierarchy, um, we put it on the same uh, level of priority uh, when it's done sort of in a community-based way. Um, we will be putting out a position statement in the coming weeks on anaerobic digestion because it can be done in a way that um, serves um, the community similarly to uh, community composting. Uh, the, the digestate that comes out of digesters can also be composted, uh, but the question had to do specifically with uh, the anaerobic versus aerobic uh, qualities, and we will have a policy or a position statement that's coming out in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. Um, other questions? Uh, somebody asked about access to presentation files, and those should be available. If you, if you can see it in your control panel, there's a section where handouts uh, is listed kind of as an option. Hopefully you should be able to access those presentations there. If not, no worries. Uh, we will be sending out a um, follow-up email and those will be included there. All right, so at this point, I'm going to introduce our final presenter, 
Um, and then any remaining questions uh, we will save for the end. But as we hand over controls to Aisha, I will introduce her. Um, Aisha Ali is the advocacy manager at Kiss the Ground, and she's a co coordinator of the Regenerate America Coalition. She has a background in research, political ecology, and communications, having previously worked in environmental communications. She holds a master's in arts of global environmental history with a focus on agricultural production and global food supply chain policies. She also specialized in California's 20th century water policy and the contemporary groundwater crisis. So without further ado, Aisha, take us away. We can't hear you yet. Let me see if I can unmute you. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> I think that worked. And just to check, you can see my screen, my presentation. It looks blank at the moment. Okay, let's try that again then. Uh -huh. There we go. We can see it. We can also see the um, tabs open on your computer, but. I hope that that doesn't get too annoying throughout this, but unfortunately I think we're gonna have to keep those up. Um, thank you everyone. And thank you Linda for the introduction. Uh, my name is Aisha Ali and I work with the Regenerate America campaign and Kiss the Ground and happy World Soils Day. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and to follow the excellent presentations from Stephen and from Sophia that really laid incredible groundwork for where we are at and really build into some of the exciting momentum that we're seeing at the federal level. So I will be talking today about compost and soil health policy in the Farm Bill. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that I'll be jumping straight into the Farm Bill and why it matters, but the Farm Bill isn't the only way to do uh, soil health policy or legislation or compost legislation at the federal level. It's just the biggest way and it's the primary way since it is a Farm Bill cycle happening right now. Um, but for example, today the Office of Public Engagement at 4 p.m. Eastern is holding a, a virtual briefing on the Biden-Harris administration's new um, draft policy for food waste reduction and recycling strategy. So just know that when I go through the Farm Bill and some of the policies out there, this is just one big track that we're looking at right now, but definitely not the only way to get involved or to take action. Um, but with that said, jumping into the Farm Bill and why it matters for all of our work from the federal level down to the local level. So the Farm Bill is an omnibus bill, which means that it is a large piece of legislation comprised of smaller bits of legislation. Um, it is the second largest bill of this nature in the U.S. actually, second only to our defense bills, and it's renewed every five to seven years. So our last farm bill was authorized in 2018, and we were due for one this year, but spoiler alert, if you didn't know already, it didn't end up going through this year. We are still working on that and deeply in that cycle, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but the farm bill affects everything from how our food is grown, how our lands are managed, what foods are available, who has access to those, because it touches on provisions for nutrition, so that's SNAP and WIC and, and food access policies, crop insurance, conservation programs such as CSP or EQUIP, rural investment into things like broadband and electrification, um, farm land access, and, and so much more. So all of this has obviously considerable ramifications for farmer livelihoods, but we do like to say that if you live or eat or breathe in America, then you're being affected by the Farm Bill because it does end up through all of these different touch points being an environment bill and a climate bill these days, um, land access and food access bill and national food security bill. So the farm bill does set the priorities for the US agricultural system because it has such an overarching reach across everything from production to distribution. And currently it does favor conventional crops and or commodity crops and conventional production systems. That's why it matters for all of us and all of our work because these programs and practices that do help rebuild soils through regeneration, like conservation composting, are not being supported to the same extent currently in the bill. So 
as I said, we were in a year that we were looking to get a new farm bill and that did not end up happening. Um, the path to a new farm bill is typically fairly straightforward. Uh, there is a House Senate committee or House Agricultural Committee and Senate Agricultural Committee and each of those and work with their, their constituents and their um, colleagues to draft a version of the farm bill that then ends up going to the floor for a vote. The committees end up putting together those bills for a combined version, which is usually not too much of an issue, and then it will go on to be voted on a final time before going to the White House for the president's signature. We're in an interesting position this year and with this farm bill because we do have a split Congress, which, as you know, we, we don't often have. So right now we're seeing the, the differences between what the Senate priorities are being led by the Democrats and the House priorities being led by GOP. Uh, we're also getting caught up in spending bills. So at the moment, we are still at the very first step in the farm bill pathway. Um, we have yet to see any markups or drafts come out of either chambers, Senate or House agricultural committees. Um, and before we move on to any other steps, we do need to have some key spending bills passed. So we're looking at the earliest, most likely, would be a June 2024 um, markup session where we're actually seeing the, the progress towards getting a combined version of the bill, and then September 2024 for the actual vote on the final bill. Um, and a little bit more on that, the way that this came about is that the farm bill, an extension was hitched to the most recent short-term spending bill. So that included the extension of the 2018 Farm Bill through September 2024, thankfully with no cuts, um, and most of the orphan programs in the Farm Bill being accounted for. But with these spending bills, that's a real issue as we look to pushing the Farm Bill into 2024, because the short-term spending bill only put the Ag FDA bill through January 19th, that funding through January 19th of next year. Um, it really just got them past the holiday season, to be honest. And we're already hearing that GOP members, uh, centrist members and farm state members are skeptical as to whether or not we'll be able to see a bill come out at that time that gets passed. Um, if you've been paying attention to News from the Hills, some of these spending bills and the Ag FDA bill in particular has been one that's been a part of the, the speakership shakeup and, and the government shutdowns that we've been looking at over the past two months. And with the Ag FDA bill, the problem is that there is the some members of the Freedom Caucus and others that are really pushing for cuts to spending in agricultural that even GOP members and definitely Dems are not looking to uphold as well as there is a, a provision they're trying to get in a ban on Mifepristone uh, included in that, which is really a no-go for, for many of these members. So all that to say, this all does delay the Farm Bill, which unfortunately is preventing progress on soil health policy, compost policy, and it is also pushing the bill into the middle of an election cycle. So starting next February or March, we're gonna really see the election season pick up because it is a presidential election as well. And that's gonna take a lot of energy and time away from the work on the Hill by Congress because they will be focused on their campaigns. Um, so that's not a great thing, but we are glad again that there were no cuts and that we do have a short-term spending bill the extension, and it does give us some more time to focus on advancing our soil and climate priorities. So with that, what does it look like to advance soil health policy via the Farm Bill? In the 118th Congress, we have had 75 bills introduced that mention or directly support soil health, whether training, or education, funding mechanisms. This is across a variety of different programs. Um, 14 bills that mention or call out regenerative agriculture, and five bills that explicitly address compost. So I'm going to run through some of these bills just to give you all a sense of the momentum that we're gaining um, and, and ways that you can tap into and support and advocate, but I'm going to try not to get too into the details or too wonky, so <laughs> please uh, bear with me. Uh, so first, of course, as Sophia mentioned, the Compost Act. This is arguably the most exciting act that uh, is directly related to compost. Um, this did have a provision of it that was focused on designating compost as a conservation practice standard. Uh, there was a 2018 interim practice standard that did get adopted in 2022 at the federal level. So we do now have conservation practice standard 336, which is the soil carbon amendment practice standard. Very glad to see that that has come through. Um, I'll say a little bit more on that later, but there is now the extra work of getting that 
adopted in each state. Um, so that work isn't over, but that part of the Compost Act is uh, taken care of. But the other part of it is really important, which is the establishment of a competitive program to award grants and loan guarantees for projects that expand access to food waste composting. Um, there is a lot in this bill, but at a glance, you know, there's grants and there's loans that would be available for a variety of hardware infrastructure development purposes. And Sylvia mentioned this in her presentation, but there is a prioritization process for these grants to be awarded that does, we're happy to see, really include some focus on making sure that these grants are, or these dollars are going to communities that need it, that haven't had this kind of investment before, opportunities for uplifting leadership from low economic um, backgrounds or communities of color tr on tribal lands and among indigenous leaders, et cetera. So this is an exciting bill that we do really support and want to see move forward. But one thing to note, and you'll hear me say this and talk about this a little bit more later on, is that there is a 200 million authorization in, called out in the bill. Um, anything right now that mentions new funding is kind of an issue in the farm bill because there is so much contention over the current spending bills, and then we know that we are likely to have a flatly funded farm bill, which means no new funding coming, and any programs that do ask for new funding would require cuts coming from somewhere else. But that is the Compost Act. Um, often paired with it, it has the same introduced, same sponsors and a lot of the same co-sponsors is the Zero Food Waste Act, which directs the EPA to establish a um, sorry, a grant program to study and reduce food waste. This includes planning, measurement, and reduction grants across a variety of different activities that would qualify. And it does have the same prioritization on diverse locations and uses with a focus on communities of color, low-income communities, and tribal communities. Again, it does have that authorization piece of 650 million for fiscal years 2023 through 2032. Uh, and then the COWS Act, this is a, a very simple, straightforward act that we hope will get included. The Converting Our Waste Sustainably Act just focuses on promoting sustainable manure management practices, especially composting. Um, it doesn't have a significant price tag that I'm aware of, if any. Um, I think it does make use of funding that exists, but it is a, a very straightforward one that we are happy to champion and see move forward as we progress. And then just really quickly running through these next two, the Recycling Composting Accountability Act just directs the EPA administrator to prepare and submit reports to Congress on the capability of the US to implement a national residential composting strategy um, and federal recycling practices, and also to collect and make that data publicly available on rates, which is a, always a good uh, piece of information to have. And the Agricultural Management Assistance Act would reauthorize and make some adjustments, including boosting funding to the uh, Agriculture Risk Management Education Program and Agricultural Management Assistance Programs. Again, the funding piece is gonna be an issue for some of these types of bills. So now that I've gone through some of the top compost bills, taking that step back because we know that soil health is uh, a great entryway to getting more compost policy passed and to start that conversation. That's really where, in my work, I focus my energy and attention. Um, with Regenerate America, we like to address the, the, the quote from FDR back in the 30s, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself, and give it a little bit of a more positive spin and say that a nation that rebuilds its soils rebuilds itself. So how can we start rebuilding our soils is our big focus. Um, and again, I'm not gonna get into all of these because I know this is a lot and this presentation is available for y'all and with links so you can read more, but we do have a slate of top bills that we've identified that would help advance, advance regenerative agriculture practices and programs and policies. Um, and some of these are really specifically very useful to the work being done around composting. So for example, we have the Streamline Conservation Practice Standards Act, with Conservation Practice Standard 336, um, as I mentioned before, that is adopted at the federal level, but it still has to be adopted per state. Um, the Conserv Streamline Conservation Practice Standard Act would help make that a little more accessible because it does have some pieces that include a little bit of um, support in terms of outreach and access to that process for, for people to learn and engage. Producers and researchers have more say in practice options. Um, so, for example, if you never heard that you needed to go and talk to your state conservationist or, or reach out to them about this to get it included at your state, then 
something like this where we're encouraging the state technical committees to do that outreach would hopefully help with this in the long run. We also have the Soil Conservation and Regeneration Education or Soil Care Act, which would establish a training program for NRCS staff and technical service providers focused on biological soil health management. Um, this is just a good one because it really makes sure that from the ground up, we have that base work of knowledge and information on soil health management systems within the NRCS so that farmers, ranchers, all producers who are going to look for that information can, can reliably go to the NRCS versus having to seek that out in, in other areas where they might have to pay a fee or um, where it's just a little less accessible. So really making sure that they're able to go to the, the most direct source and get that training. A couple of other key bills, the Increasing Land Access Security and Opportunities Act is one that we're a big fan of. It provides some support for, it, it would provide 100 million per year in support for young and beginning farmers. Um, this one is one that we really like. Again, it has that price tag, so that is a concern that it will not get pushed through, but we are hoping that there'll be enough strong support and champions, uh, particularly among Democrats to get it, to get it in there. And then we also have the Peer Learning for Agricultural Conservation and Education Act. This one is a no cost adjustment to the Regional Conservation Partnership Program to fund peer to peer technical assistance projects. If you're a farmer or if you work for farmers, you know that they learn best from other farmers because those are the people who know what they're going through and, and have done those same trials and errors. And so really making sure that there is some opportunity at the federal level for funding for that is a priority for us. Um, and then also going to call out the Agricultural Resilience Act. If you haven't heard of this bill, uh, look into it. It's a wonderful, robust bill that really paints a new vision for what we can do in our agricultural system for our food. Um, it is also one of the first, if not the only actually bill that would give us a, a solid metric to, to work towards, which is to become net zero by 2040 in terms of emissions from the agricultural sector. So this bill does have a, a very long list of things that it would do, including some work on food waste reduction, composting, um, but it really just paints a, a comprehensive vision for how we can transition our system, our agricultural system towards resilience and, and regeneration in the future. Uh, and so now I'm gonna make a little bit of a pivot from that. That's an overview of all the different incredible policies that we're seeing supporting champion and the momentum is building behind, but we're gonna return to some of the key issues for this farm bill. So as I mentioned at the top, there is passing the Ag FDA spending bill. We will know as soon as the Congress reconvenes in January, what that uh, likelihood is for that getting passed on time. Um, we, again, we're, we're not, holding our breath that they'll pass by January 19th, but we would be really happy to see that take place so that we can speed up the process of the farm bill and not have to push that too, too far down into the election season. Um, if it does get pushed down, there's always the chance that Congress will try to actually do another resol continuing resolution for the farm bill and get it past the presidential election, uh, which is in some ways could be beneficial, but we don't know for sure because that could have us doing a farm bill under a completely new Congress who hadn't been the ones in charge of writing it. Um, and it could just really change everything and turn it on its head for better or for worse. It would be hard to know for sure. And then the last piece is the IRA funding for conservation. So the IRA money has become a major flashpoint in the farm bill negotiations. It was reported out by Politico just last month. And if you haven't heard about the IRA, um, the, it is the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed last September, or September 2022, sorry. And there is a major funding fight happening around it right now in the ag space at the federal level, because the IRA did provide a really incredible historic investment of 20 billion into conservation programs, um, working land programs. So that's things like EQIP, CSP, RCPP, as well as conservation technical assistance. And it included climate guardrails on that funding. We're big fans of this. We think it's incredible to see this kind of, of financial investment and it really would potentially transform the way that our agricultural system works if, if these dollars stay there and if we can really have those get out to farmers on the ground. All farms are eligible for these types of programs. So while obviously it's not gonna serve all of the millions of farmers that we have here in ranchers, it would have a really significant impact. 
However, as the spending bill fights are set to pick back up, we already know this is going to be a really contentious issue because again, with that flat funding, House GOP members have already been pretty honest that they are targeting those funds for diversion towards some of their priorities, which would be commodity crops, boosting reference prices, et cetera, um, which studies have been done by groups like the Environmental Working Group, as well as others, that if those diversions do take place, those funds would likely benefit as few as 6,000 of the wealthiest commodity crop producing conventional farms. Uh, so that's something that we're definitely activating against and encourage others to. And House GOP members are also publicly fighting against the climate guardrails, stating that even if these funds do remain in conservation, that it is a, a barrier of access because not all farmers should be held to those standards, which again, is not something that we necessarily agree with, but we are maintaining bipartisan language and working to see where we can find some common ground on these issues. Uh, that said though, any new costs must have equal cuts in the farm bill if we do have that flat baseline, but Chairwoman Stabenow of the Senate Ag Committee has made it very clear that her position is that if these IRA dollars are at risk, if House GOP members continue to target them, they will not be added to the baseline of the bill. And if that takes place, then it's great that they'll be protected, but it does mean that those funds won't be available for, for any flexibility of use um, by new farm bill programs. So for example, some of the bills that I mentioned that we're looking at like the Soil Care Act um, or the uh, Place Act would make use of these IRA investments into those programs. But if they're kept complete out of the farm bill, there is some concern that they would be really just left at the NRCS and there wouldn't be any flexibility to be a little creative in how those dollars are spent for the best. So what can we do right now? Uh, one thing again is protecting the IRA dollars. Conservation programs work for all farmers and farmland conservation works for the future. So protecting the 20 billion for ag conservation is one of the biggest things we can do right now for soil health policy, regenerative agriculture policy, and again, that knock-on effect of compost policy. So let's take action. Um, I recommend starting by learning a little bit more. This is a really brief, quick and dirty overview of soil health policy. So follow the folks that are leading in the advocacy space on this. Um, I've linked it here and you'll see this in the presentation, but the Regenerate American Action Center has a lot of good ways to get started. Also the USCC Action Center, NSAC. Um, and I know that in the uh, report that Sophia was reviewing, there's a whole list of others at the end that I recommend you uh, look through and just see what they're talking about and see what resonates with you. And if you're looking for specific ways to take action, call or write your representatives. Almost all of these organizations offer a way to do so quickly and easily, but you can also do it on your own. If there's something that really speaks to you that you don't see out there, go to find your representative at congress.gov and, and just send them a letter or give them a call and tell them that you wanna see this legislation or these issues supported. You wanna see the IRA funds protected or just that you wanna see a better farm bill because the farm bill is one of those pieces of legislation that often happens sort of out of sight of the public. So it is great for, for your representatives to know that there are people who are concerned, who are watching, and who really wanna see it you know, go down a path that, uh, that will put us on a track to a better future. So contact your representatives, sign the petition for regeneration. That's a really easy way to just add your name to a growing list. And finally, contact your state conservationist to support the adoption of Conservation Practice Standard 336. I'm sure the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has more on this. I know USCC does, but that is a really wonderful way to bridge the gap between federal and local policy action. So contact them and let's make sure that they're keeping that in mind. And with that, I am done with my presentation. Thank you all so much. Amazing, thank you so much, Aisha. Um, and if the rest of our panelists could turn on their videos, we're going to move into Q&A. All righty. Okay, so we had a number of questions coming in. Um, we had a number on PFAS, polyfluoral alkyl substances, uh, which obviously are a very important issue. And unfortunately, uh, for many farmers, especially in Maine, uh, who have already um, experienced the, the impacts of um, of that being in their soils um, and in Maine it was from biosolids um, it's attributed to biosolids being uh, land applied so there are a number of questions about including biosolids in 
in compost as a feedstock. Um, and I think we've already heard that uh, Maine's policy is actually a model and we'll be updating uh, our guide to reflect that. But Sophia, I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add there. Um, I'll just say that we we do welcome more feedback because um, this is, you know, a, a major issue and um, is getting lots of visibility at the moment for good reason, but um, there isn't a lot of existing guidance out there already, um, especially on policy on PFAS and compost. So um, again, we will be making updates as we learn more and thank you very much for the feedback yeah and i'll just add that so the route that we ended up taking because we are still learning and it seems like there's still a lot of um kind of research being done and what best practices will include should include um but certainly uh testing maybe not assuming that biosolids will are clean or not going to contribute pfas is probably the way to go um uh and testing compost for uh and feedstocks really for pfas and microplastics is really going to be essential going forward um especially when it's being used for food production but steven or aisha i don't know if you all have anything to add on the pfas discussion before we move on to the next the next question yeah quickly uh there's some states like massachusetts that have um produced uh, reports and uh on PFAS. So a lot of states are um, submitting or have uh, legislation regarding PFAS because of inadequate um, action at the federal level. So I think it's an important, um, just like uh, on healthy soils or composting policy, having activity at the state level on legislation will help move policy at the federal level. So it's important on PFAS to really look at making sure that your each state has um, restrictions against use use of sewage sludge, per, in particular, uh, because it's a huge contaminant, and that ends up be getting into compost um, and and so on. So I think um, there's a real opportunity here to move the needle with 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 whatever you come out with with ILSR or other groups on PFAS. Yeah, I would just echo that that at the federal level, we are not seeing enough movement on PFAS. Unfortunately, it's 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 rising i think is a conversation point the epa is looking into some different pathways for regulation but definitely echo see them at starting at local or state levels to get that elevated is crucial wonderful thank you all uh for your thoughts there um uh we did get a couple questions that i'm thinking is going to be directed to sophia uh, about examples of uh, policy or ordinances at the municipal or local level. I know you included a couple of those examples in your presentation, but I don't know if you want to direct folks to particular ones. Um, I would say look through the guide. There are a number of, um, of course, state policies, but a number of um, policies at the, the county and the city level highlighted in there um, that are good examples and also um, I did put a link to our compost rules library that has like a broader array of um, composting policies and a lot of those are um, local level policies um, at the county or city level. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and then a question, maybe everyone on the panel, um, someone asked about whether there's a uh, so we've heard of watersheds being protected in policy, but is there something comparable to like a soil shed? Um, any any thoughts there? Sort of protecting broad swaths of of soil based on that yeah. concept. Yeah, um, in a lot of the drafting, that's the implication is that when we're talking about various bills that we submitted in in some states, for soil and watershed health. So the implication of being together, we there's a lot of work in New York State towards having a, a bigger discussion on conservation districts working collaboratively at the watershed scale. And there's been a lot of work of different groups like uh, Hudson uh, uh, Carbon and, and 
folks that really they work on ecosystem health is to have they're having pilot programs that are actually measuring and doing work at the watershed level so i think it's yeah if, if, if people are interested in that there's a great opportunity now with a lot of work of integrating optimized uh, direct measurement with satellite data to create uh, you know uh, monitoring and improvement of of a uh, soil shed or a watershed scale um, 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 improvement. Awesome. Thank you for that um, overview, that, that perspective. Um, okay, so another question that came up. The benefits of compost to soil health is undisputed, yet there's much work to do in, uh, for increasing the amount of compost that is applied to soils. Um, can any of the presenters discuss why more compost is not currently being applied and any strategies uh, that could be used to directly increase the practice? Any thoughts from anyone? Yeah, um, that's a, actually very regional. I mean, some places there's too much compost and no one to take it. In some places, there's not enough compost. A lot of it is uh, transportation and infrastructure. I know there's been a lot of work um, in California and the Southwest and some areas to improve the uh, distribution networks and connecting uh, folks to connecting sources to people who want compost. A lot of work with zero food waste folks to help uh, divert organic waste at restaurants and so on. So there's a lot of work and it seems to be that the, uh, you know, gating item is having people facilitating or there being maybe state funding as seed work to work on a pilot program to help improve, you know, um, experience in developing these networks for uh, providing and, and taking compost. A lot of, um, there's an, there's an unequal footing financially between liquid uh, nutrients and compost. And so one of the big problems we have is because liquid fertilizer doesn't pay for its externalities. Um, there's an unlevel playing field between compost and liquid fertilizers. If you know, there's some efforts to um, address that through state fertilizer fees and other, you know, improving the you know, e e leveling the playing field between compost and, and liquid fertilizers, I think we'll see an improvement in, in the use of compost. I would add to this myself that um, the, we're, we're big on, at ILS, I were big on uh, building out local composting infrastructure, and that uh, I think is a huge um, variable for the cost of applying compost when it comes to farmers. Uh, sort of expenses uh, because compost may not be that expensive, may or may not be that expensive to buy, but it's actually the, if it's being shipped from a long distance, the transportation costs of a reasonably heavy material is really where costs and also climate impacts accumulate. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why we are big proponents of on-site composting, so on-farm composting um, and just building out local local production of high quality compost. So. Yeah, so some, so yeah, so some of that I was trying to say, so getting some appropriations to help pay for the upfront costs of making that local composting is, is part of a pilot program would be crucial towards, you know, uh, you, you know, lowering the cost of entry so that that can happen. Yeah, I'll just, kind of sum it up that there are um, many barriers to composting local or not and um, setting up the policy infrastructure if you can call it that um, is really key to enable um, compost production and compost use and um, really to remove those barriers like whether it's uh, zoning or funding or permitting um, mm -hmm. We want to get rid of those barriers and allow uh, folks to do what they do. Great, thank you all for that. Um, and Ayesha, for a question for you, and I apologize if you already answered it, so just let me know if you did. Um, but there's a question about, um, so with the challenges related to 
the funding of the farm bill, cuts needing to be made somewhere. Um, what's the prospect for the Compost Act and uh, in terms of pushing forward any new funding authorizations? What are, what are ways that people can, I don't know, support or what, what are lessons learned for everyone? Yeah, I mean, there is strong support for the Compost Act, so especially in the Senate side, and we know that Chairwoman Sabanow has a, a real desire to see the bill come through with her vision and her fingerprints on it, since she's not running for re-election. This is her sort of her pet project for the next year ahead. Um, in terms of funding for, for any bill, I mean, the, the likelihood of getting something passed with funding in the Farm Bill is, is small, but there is a chance that it could always be put through as an amendment where the the funding is is nil in terms of the baseline funding for the farm bill and it just becomes something that is appropriated each year. It's always a pathway. Um, that's not how the Compass Act is currently set up, but it doesn't mean that we can't get it and then we'll just have to fight for funding year by year, which isn't ideal, but it is a workaround to at least get it in as legislation. I'd like to echo that by having the elements of the compost bill at the federal level submitted as something that's like state match. You know, the federal government likes seeing leverage of state funding and vice versa. So I think um, a display of interest in the policies of the Compost Act in the state legislatures would certainly help for that to happen, whether it's part of the farm bill or, or annual appropriations. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, another kind of general question. Uh, are there any strategies that folks have seen to counter greenwashing uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to claims of harms from compost? I think we're all curious about what those claims would be yeah, <laughs> to answer uh, that. I know uh, we had a case in the county in Maryland where um, composting was um, getting confused with, well, small scale on farm composting was getting confused with large scale industrial composting. Um, but also I think just in general with waste disposal. Um, and so there, it was a matter of trying to differentiate that scale does matter, um, that composting is into, like intimately tied with uh, farming, that it's a farming activity, um, but that um, scale matters and also uh, you know, following best management practices and all that. So that's more sort of on the composting end of things, but I don't know if anything else comes to mind for folks. Stephen? Yeah, uh, it, one of the problems at the local level, non-farming, is the, uh, you know, concerns about the spread of invasive species um, because the compost is not necessarily made at a high enough temperature long enough times uh, in a way that uh, eliminates the seeds that can be, so they can become vectors for invasive species. So I think a lot that would help is, you know, some sort of local certification or guidance on, you know, how the compost is made and how it's, it would help you know, defeat some of those concerns or at least address them properly. Uh, and so I, a lot has to do, like, is it misinformation or lack of knowledge? So education is important. So again, it's one of these situations where uh, th either through the regulatory process and setting regulations or local ordinances, if there's a, a way of um, putting forth uh, a process so to, to differentiate between mulch and compost and, and, and manure, you know, there's, there's this lack of clarity and not all compost is the same and helping clarify that uh, helps alleviate a lot of these problems. So we're speaking the same language. That's usually a lot of these problems are because people aren't using the same terms or using terms differently. You know, if you have to get them to be the agreement, that's why there's so much effort now unfolding to really define regenerative agriculture so to avoid the greenwashing and co-opting of the term regenerative agriculture. Same thing goes for compost. 
uh, definitions are incredibly important, um, and that's where um, having model policies that can be adapted is really helpful. Um, so, um, in the last, since we're at time now, I'm just wondering if the panelists have any sort of final thoughts or words for for the folks on the call, because we saw a lot of them are or composters or already using compost. Um, we have a fair amount of advocates and, and policymakers, government representatives. Any final thoughts from anyone? I don't know. I'd like to see a lot more conversation or or, or public process of composters really you know, sharing the difficulties and barriers they're having. I'm sure there's some um, places where that's already happening, but it'd be good to know about what people are, are, are sharing as far as what they're uh, seeing, because that would really help to share with policy folks to make sure that we connect the dots between the problems and issues that people are seeing and working towards solutions to those problems. Yeah, I would just add on to that. I, I hope that we did this well enough through this presentation today, but really thread that needle between the local the state and the federal policies, because there is a really, important opportunity for positive feedback between all three where we can point to the models happening we can point to movement in other areas and say this is what we want to see here this is how we see it being implemented over there and we want to model that we want to emulate it and just really tap into the broader movement um, you know live local think global and and take that to heart i mean soil is well, it's our common ground, as cliche as it may be. So you know, the more we can do all together across the, the broad spectrums and in our own backyards, the, the more progress we'll see be happening. That was perfectly said. Um, I think we all have a role to play and um, we all have our, you know, our different expertises, but the more you can um, educate yourselves and the people around you, the people you work with, um, in your various communities, um, the better off we'll all be. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm really encouraged to see so many of you on this webinar. Yes, and so many people that stayed until the very end. So thank you all. Thank you, Stephen, Aisha, and Sophia. Um, we look forward to continuing the discussion. Um, so certainly keep in touch. Um, and we look forward to having more policy-focused webinars in the future, so definitely plan to join us. But in the meantime, happy so uh, World Soil Day, and have a, have a great rest of the week.